check. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Get ready for ethology. Rudolf Schenkel on submission. Microphone check. Microphone check. We should be going live as soon as I get a audio. I see you and hear me. Okay, good. We're good to go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's class. It is May 22nd, 2021. And today's lesson is on ethology. We're still in the ethology module. And it is a part two to Rudolf Schenkel. And this stream in particular is on, based off of Rudolf Schenkel's 1967 paper, which is titled Submission, Its Features and Functions in the Wolf and Dog. And there is a link in the notes that brings to the paper that it can be uploaded until the... I fix the fix the site. Just make sure to right click on when you go over here. Actually, I'll move over. This goes to the actual study and the article attachment is over here. But depending on your browser, it may work for you. If you're having an issue until I fix it, at least in Google Chrome, right click on it and then open link in the new tab. And then you can you can get the whole study. I have it I have it over here in another tab for for reference if we have to go back and forth. Um, without further ado, let's get started on it. So if you are just watching, if you are just watching the stream and you haven't been following along, this is part of a series. It is always best, it is definitely best to learn how to train dogs and solve behavior problems by learning things in a certain order. If you learn things in a certain order and you create a foundation, it makes it much easier to understand each lesson that follows. So this is part of an ethology module and I would highly recommend, depending on where the menu may be at the time or where you're watching this video, is to certainly, this is part of the 5.0 series, is we definitely want to watch some of these beforehand. If if we're mo with ethology, we definitely want to do the ethology intro. And for sure, we want to do the first, the first Rudolf Schenkel stream, for sure. Now, what this lecture is going to cover is going to be, what does Rudolf Schenkel say about submission and its function. Number two, what are three different forms of conflict that are often associated with submission? Number three, what are the two main categories of submission? Four, how does the behavior of the dominant canine affect the submissive canine? And number five, which is really why we are all here, is how does this relate to the professional dog trainer? Why should we be, be learning this stuff? Now, before I get started, I have, whoops, I have, um, I have this, I have the study in the site. And I always stress to everyone, highly recommend, read your own source material. So I'm going to give you my take on why I believe this study is important. And I'm going to make some of my own interpretations. But it is very important for you to read these things yourself. In order to be the best dog trainer out there that is free to, to you want to be free from the opinions and rhetoric of others. So I'm going to give you my take, but use it as a starting point. This study, it's not that long. To, watch, to read these papers, it's not that long at all. Too long for me to go over sentence by sentence in a stream, but 
please read it for your for yourself, all right? Because there's a lot in there. I'm going to tell you what I think are the most important points, but there's a, there's a lot of good things there. Now, first part is what, a, what does Rudolf Schenkel say about submission and, ex, and its function? At the time he wrote this, and this is in 1967, and remember the one that we did just before this on the expressions of wolves was done in 20 years before. I think it was 1947. So this is 20 years after the study on the expressions, which he's just talking about the, the, the expressions of the wolf. We can't interpret really how they're feeling if we can't read their body language, basically. And he goes over the main points in there. This is 20 years later. And it's pretty cool because there's extensive um, references to Conrad Lorenz. And also there's even a reference to David Meech. So we really get this nice, I really like looking at the beginning of ethology. And remember, Conrad Most, like he's the father of ethology. This is fair, we're talking about written history. The study of ethology is really fairly new. And what is cool is that dogs, canines, were really one of the most important and first things that were, that were studied. When it comes to submission and dominance, um, the information, the start of ethology, the concepts that we, that we apply to a lot of other animals, including primates and, and humans, was really first studied on, on canines, really. So, so it's really cool. And what I like about this, too, is we even get, while, um, while Rudolf Schenkel, when Rudolf Schenkel was doing this study, uh, David Meech, entered the scene too. And there's even a reference to some of David, Me David Meech's first um, thing studying, studying wild wolf. So, so read the study. It's very cool. But the issue was there was conflict. So what was happening is he was trying to get, make a better, um, a better functional definition of submission. At the time that he wrote this, his motivation for writing this was just submission was used in just about any concept, any context where there were two animals that were having a conflict and it ended with one being um, superior and one being inferior and all different types of contexts. But, but it wasn't very helpful from an ethology point of view of understanding the behavior. So he wanted to split some of these behaviors up and put submission in its own category to separate it from, in particular, two different types of situations where we have the same species that have conflict. There's a superior and an, and an inferior, but it doesn't necessarily relate to his definition of what he feels submission should be, which I also believe is the most useful way to learn about what submission is and is going to be very helpful to us as a dog trainer. So let's go start going, going into this. Um, all right. So um, Rudolf Schenkel, what he said, what submission basically is not is he basically says that it's not a cinnamon for inferior or, or defeated and that submission is my take on it, and we got to read his whole thing, he talks about it a lot, is basically submission is an impulse and effort of the inferior toward friendly and harmonic social integration. So it's not just about being defeated or being weaker in a situation. Submission is related also to an impulse and an effort to have a friendly, a friendly relationship. Now, he described three different forms of conflict associated with the superior and inferior within the same species, interaction between animals of the same species. But submission is only really correct for one. And I am going to show you some, some video examples. Now, one is severe fight based on intolerance. So which basically ends in the flight of the inferior or death is the outcome. Cutoff signals have no effect. 
and he gives an example. This is from the paper right over here. He wrote, uh, these, are, these are examples. So intolerance, perhaps fixed on territory. So um, escape or breakdown. And you know the, the terminal phase of the conflict is, is the inferior basically escapes or, or is, is killed. The other type is a ritualized fight over a privilege that ends up with a claim ritual of the inferior, which automatically blocks the aggression by the superior. An example, and I'll show you, um, I'll show you a couple examples, is mating rights. Is sometimes with mating rights, we we may have, especially with um, animals that are not in the not in the same pack, is the cutoff signal is not necessarily submission. The when when one canine stops giving up the claim, or giving up the aggression that ends the fight. It's not necessarily going to be submission, formal submission. And then the last, which is submission, is going to be when there really is an effort of the inferior towards social integration. So let's get into this a little bit deeper. Now, intolerance. Intolerance, we see this in ethology, mostly if we're talking about canines, is when there is competition with those outside of their family units over territory. This is mainly where we see it. And I put different examples here of videos. I even have an article. This is an article over here. It's, it's pretty good. This article has information about um, certain research, which shows the most common killer of wolves and their natural state is other wolves over territorial disputes. Um, what happens is when they have fights over territory, it generally, in general, I'm sure there's always exceptions, it does not matter if another wolf submits during these fights. They're going to kill each other. So you can have all the tuck tail, all the stuff that we saw in the previous studies, is they're going in for the kill. So when they're in these conflicts, if if the inferior does not escape, manage to escape, they're likely going to get killed. Vocalizations and submissive behavior is not going to stop the aggression from the superior, from the superior canine. So I put a couple of videos here. I'm not gonna play them. These are just extra, extra things. This was from a documentary. It shows a, it shows, um, this is from something on National Geographic or something. It was actually, I remember watching this documentary. It was pretty good, but it shows territorial dispute. And for sure, these, these wolves were gonna, the, the invading wolves that won the superior ones definitely would have killed these other wolves if they did not, if they did not flee. And I have seen even other documentaries where you see the death of a wolf. I was able to pull up too. I believe it was from the same documentary where um, the wolves killing, killing coyote in their territory. I believe it was from the same documentary where the previous, the previous pack of wolves were, were actually tolerant of the of the coyotes and even let the coyotes feed off of their remains. But then when the new group came in, they were intolerant and you see them kind of catch and kill a coyote. And it does not matter what body language that coyote does. It's going to die. Now remember coyotes are also canines and they can, they can um, in interbreed. Not the best example, but how is this going to relate to us as professional dog trainers? It does help us explain we need to be able to explain and understand certain behavioral problems that we're dealing with. Remember, a behavior problem is a problem when it causes a problem for the dog's owner. So with a lot of territorial aggression issues that people face, we deal with intolerance, where that's some of the worst aggression that you often deal with as a professional dog trainer, where if another canine, uh, a neighbor's a neighbor's dog comes on the property, um, that dog may end up dying. You may get some very, very aggressive behavior based off of 
territorial aggression. That's one example. So it doesn't matter if once that dog gets in your yard, if it's tucking its tail and it's yelping, it may end up dying. So we need to understand that and understand the origins of that particular behavior. And it can help us shape our plants, which is, of course, for another stream in, uh, in the future. Now, next one is, is, um, is when there is a claim for, when it's about a claim for some sort of privileges, you can get a defeat without submission. And I put two situations here that I thought were relevant and can give you examples over here. Is um, one I put, um, I put some I put some footage in Pakistan of illegal dog fights, and I definitely do not condone dog fighting um, for a lot of reasons, which I think are the same reasons uh, of other people don't don't condone it. But I do watch certain footage to learn from, and the reason why I wanted to put the footage of the dog fighting is in, um, let's see, which is in the, in the study over here, there seems to be some conflict and confusion where Rudolf Schenkel is writing about something that, let me see, that Conrad Lorenz wrote, but did not have any, you know, there was no like video footage or photographs of anything of the event. And then also um, another researcher um, tried to illustrate the concept and there seems to be this hole in this study about um, something that Conrad Lorenz wrote in severe fights that the animal that submits may sometimes just turn its head and, and growl and show its neck. And this did not really mesh with anything that it seemed that Rudolf Schenkel had experienced working with his observations, which seemed like mostly of closed, of captive wolves. And I'm not sure what else he was really studying over here at, 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 at this point. But this whole thing struck out to me. But when I read this part over here, it reminded me of what I saw in formalized dog fighting where let's see where are we at over here where we get these things called head turns where you can have and this is important i like to relate this but why are we talking about this as professional dog trainers is years ago i remember telling me i actually wrote an article for some magazine in estonia i believe and it was translated i was ex i mean this was a while ago this was like 16, 17 years ago, um, where I was asked to write an article in Estonia about people that were having dog-on-dog -dog aggression issues um, with their dogs. And I remember I just wrote, oh, basically put muzzles on them and let them have it out. And whoever wins, you'll probably then get a, a dominant submissive um, relationship. Not true. It's, it's definitely not true. Also... If you have, you're dealing with a dog on dog aggression issue within the household, sometimes you will get fights. You will get fights and one dog will get its butt kicked and even turn away from the fight at some point. It does not necessarily mean you now have a dominant submissive relationship going on um, here. Um, you can have defeat without, without submission. And... Um, and this is important when we get into it. So this is going into the future, but we need to understand ethology before we could get into heavy troubleshooting and plants for behavioral problems and creating solutions for people. So I'm going to go over here and show you some things. First, I just put, even though this doesn't show the behavior, because some people in general are just going to have questions about what's going over on here in Pakistan. So I found a video where they're interviewing some of these guys. And in Pakistan, here at these dog fights, they're using a breed called Bully Kudas, 
which basically means heavily wrinkled dog in their their language. And I put some timestamps here where the dogs are fighting. And this is very, very similar, even with like formal fighting with American pit bulls in the United States and other places where, let me see, I'm going to click on this. I'm going to go to about uh, the 25. And if you watch this, what you have is you have these dogs that are fighting with each other. And neither of them, even with, I mean, these first two dogs, they're fighting for like 25 minutes, I think, for the first timestamp. And they're back and forth. And neither of them has any type of body language that has anything to do with submission. And the way that these dog fights work is really it's the first dog that gives up, which is normally the way these things end. And if we look over here, let me say I said about the 25, about the 25 minute mark over here. As these dogs are getting tired, one of them does a head turn. Well, this one just walked away. All right. But it's not showing any type of submissive behavior, what we'd call to the dog. It was just like, I had it. I don't want it. And that's when they generally end the, end the fights with these, with these dog fights over here. And, but I'm going to show that there is consistency when it comes to a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of fights, a lot of dog fights that are not really about, um, cause and relation that are about that where dogs don't have any interest in really any type of friendly interaction with each other. I'm going to dump a head over here. Same thing to about the uh, 38 minute mark. I said. Same thing, two other dogs fighting. We're not going to have any type of, um, yeah, this one's turning its head. All right. So this is what I believe Conrad Lorenz was referring to. And it is possible for these dogs to growl. They're just given a warning that they're going to fight if it keeps going on. And I believe in this case too, I think it was this one. Yeah. The dog, this dog doesn't want to fight anymore. But then the other dog grabbed it by the leg and the dog never really submitted, just didn't want to fight. And then that actually ended up renewing the fight. And they, I believe they ended the fight here because they said technically, officially that dog gave, gave up. All right. So this is referring to this. This is, I would say is relevant if you're looking at the, at this Shankel study. What is being discussed on page, this was must have been taken out of like a larger book. It says page 320, but it's it's just page two in the PDF that you can upload. It's about it's about the discussion related to this image over here. Okay. Um let's see. Now, next one I'm gonna show here is this good old footage, which I show a lot, this is um, the street dogs video is just a wealth of, of like subtle information going on over here. And this is a case too, where there is no submission. There is a defeat. I believe everyone has seen this before and I could play it a bit, but what we have over here, and this is why this is great to watch after the first Shankle, um, Shankle study is you'll be able to recognize there is not going to be any what we would call submissive body language, even though they're fighting over a female in heat. Even though this dog was defeated and gives up, that's what ends the aggression, the cutoff um, from this dog. But this dog never actually submits. And if so if we watch it, um, I got the volume off on here just because the the... It's not going to be that important that we have the vocalizations from the dog and the narrator. But if we watch this, all these dogs over here, none of them are submitting to each other. They're doing other behavior, but we wouldn't really call it su submission. And then this one, and here we go. We talked about actually that pin tail in the Shankel study that I talked about. That's cool. We actually see it here. You usually see it a moment before a dog is about ready to pounce. Watch this, this brindle dog's tail 
the moment before he pounces on the Rottweiler that's mating. You see that pinned, that kinked straight tail? This is, I'm about to brawl. I'm about to brawl. So, and he pounces, he loses, he gets tossed to the ground. But what we have over here, this is not necessarily submission inside of his body language. And you can technically, as far as I'm concerned, you could even have fearful moments in a dog where all this gets pulled back and still not really have what would be afterwards uh, a formal su um, submissive dominant relationship afterwards. I mean, this is just... It goes on, the uh, Roddy gives him another shake. He holds him there. It's a little, that's a drawing. I don't think this looks very accurate, what's going on up over there. But this, this drawing on the bottom is pretty accurate. You can get a dog that's defeated and has completely, um, still has a more assertive and not submissive submissive body language but you see when it's over over here let's say the dog bounces up let's see the video should restart he bounces up there's really no formal submission we get some common signals and stuff to talk about later but he's getting ready to he's we wouldn't really call this submission matter of fact his tail is getting ready in fight zone again and I'm not sure what goes on over here in the unedited version if he comes back at him again or not, but you dog fights do not necessarily end in submission. And let's see, I see some chitter chatter in here. Let's see what you guys are saying. Oh yeah, the street dogs is narrated by Queen Latifah for some reason. But yeah, this is this is TV, right? So you can't listen to the can't listen to the to the narrators, right? Um, be much better if we had Conrad Lorenz narrating, but we get Queen Latifah, Queen Latifah, Conrad Lorenz wasn't available, wasn't available, or David Meech, or, or Shankle, that'd be good, um, so let's see, do feral dogs form stable plaque hierarchies, if so, the hierarchy is strictly linear, that's going to be for another stream art. That's a good question, though. But everything we learn here helps us as we as we move on. That's why we do it do it in order. But yeah, the feral dog park packs are very interesting. Are very interesting. Now he talks about true submission in canines, and he divides it up into. Two different categories, basically. Active submission and, and passive submission. Now, the active submission and passive submission, I put a couple of videos over here. Is, and I'm not sure if this is the first time it was mentioned, because I hear this a lot, active submission and passive um, submission. If anyone else finds a study where it's, where it's talked about earlier, Probably is. Um, what he what he described with what Rudolf Schenkel described is that dogs canines did not develop a separate um, separate behaviors for communicating submission. That what happened is it just evolved from their their puppy behaviors. In particular, the behaviors as it relates to their mother. So the active submission is based off of like friendly and begging behaviors towards the mother and, and even towards other. And then afterwards, towards the rest of the pack, mostly for begging for food, um, begging for food and coming underneath and licking the face that causes them to, to regurgitate. And then he has... Passive submission and passive submission is much more related to the behaviors that they do when they submit to the assertive behaviors of their mother 
mostly during during cleaning activities, right? Because young puppies, a lot of animals, they they need help defecating and urinating and they get licked and it gets cleaned up as she does it. They keep the nest clean and they assume the same sort of postures that you see when they're little tiny puppies. Um, it's related to these. So I have this video over here, right? Um, which everyone recognizes this stuff, right? I mean, there's, this is a fun video, actually. It shows a lot of, a lot of greetings. So the dogs, the dogs recognize the owners and the act of submission. Yeah, we're going to get the wag and tail. We're going to get the ears back. We get all this submissive look and body language. And a lot of it is up towards the face and licking. And it's just, it evolved from that puppy behavior. And this is, this is a cute video if you happen to go through it. It's just, it's tons of dogs, tons of dogs doing this say and it's very consistent right it's very consistent this would be this would be active active submission and this isn't just for greetings right sometimes you could just call your dog over and they give you this more you know wet lower wag and tail and goofy behavior and then over here i just put um I found this video here it's mostly just illustrations and the reason why is because passive submission is generally is generally going to be um, um, associated, especially when we see these more like extreme um, extreme poses where the dog freezes up and tucks her tail like this. That it can be, you know, that it is associated more with um, with fear or more intimidation, and but we get these intermediate, these intermediate behaviors um, from them too, where you get in between, where they don't seem as fearful. Some of them are getting up and wagging their tail a bit. And I'll show you an example of, this is a cool video I found that shows uh, an intermediate between the, between the two. And this one has videos of a, looks like some young lab puppies that, some trainer put them in a group it's a little jack russell terrier and these these uh these labs are really really trying to have friendly relationship being submissive to some of these other dogs and they're showing a lot of active submission but then they go in between a couple times in this video i believe they sort of flop over on their back for a moment then they come back up it's not just with the uh, Jack Russell. I know it happens like with the German Shepherd. Those little puppies, they just, they want to make, they want to make friends. Let's see. Somewhere, somewhere we see the, I think over here. Yeah, we see them kind of go down on the side a bit. This, these are much, much more active. All right. So you get everything in between. There's a lot of gray areas. Um, over here, but I'm just showing you two, two extremes over here. Now, this brings me to the next point of our, of our stream over here. Uh, so this, read this, because this, I'm just showing you some, some highlights to encourage you to, to read through it yourself. Because there's, there's really a lot of good things in here. I just put like, I put a couple paragraphs over here and highlighted some is, oh, I forgot making my notes here. That doesn't make sense. Don't worry about that. So submission, this is important. Submission is not something that naturally triggers a predictable response from another dog. It depends on, it's not, you know, a dog doesn't act submissive. Then all of a sudden a dog's like, okay, I'm your, I'm your buddy now. Right. So important, important when troubleshooting things, or if you have a dog, it's like, oh, this dog is so submissive. He should be fine with your dog. Um, you could deal with into you could deal with intolerance of all different all different levels, and even uh, Rudolf Schenkel mentions that even the three different types of interaction that he put into categories with mm -hmm. canines, from just complete intolerance and just um, uh, contests that just get cut off when there's no longer a conflict of some sort of resource, and true submission 
where the submissive dog actively desires a friendly and inferior role to the superior individual, that you even get gray areas between those. All right. And you will see those like you will see sometimes when we're trying to integrate dogs before where it even starts off where there's intolerance and you you get them together a little bit longer. And there's, you know, it, it becomes like these gray areas where they become tolerant. So this is on a broad sense to help us as we move further along inside of these this this coursework. Now, submission does not automatic, you know, it's not trigger automatic responses. And what he basically said here, I didn't finish my notes over here, but but what, what he was saying is depending on, it's a two-way thing. The, the submissive behavior depends a lot on the reactions of the superior animal. And I'm going to read this, even though I highlighted some things here to break it up, I'm just going to read this whole section because I thought it, it was it was good. He says, from the point of view of motivation, we may define submission in the wolf and dog as an impulse, an effort of the inferior toward friendly and harmonic social integration. And that's what I put up there for his definition. Even though you're going to see different definitions from like Conrad Lorenz and stuff like that. Um, but this is my favorite and most functional for dog training. It's what we're looking for. It's what we're looking for when we are interacting with a dog. And of course, it's what we're looking for when we try to pair dogs together that are gonna to have to live together or interact with each other often. The variations in form and motivation show that submission is a social role which depends on the response of the partner. It belongs to a social situation or scene to which both the inferior and the superior contribute. So, Submission, I highlighted this part. Submission can only develop in the inferior when the superior shows tolerance or at least does not destroy in the inferior the expectance of tolerance. And if you, he mentions in the full paper situations where you can basically have a submissive animal submissive dog but if another dog is intolerant yeah it could turn into extreme fear defecation running away defensive behavior so you really need in order for submission to flourish there needs to be an expectation of of tolerance next um, the different types of submission correspond with the nuances in the attitude of the superior so the more the superior shows tolerance and friendliness, the more active the type of submission. So if, and this is through his observations with other dogs, and what's cool is if you have experience working with humans and dogs, you will see this too. The more tolerant we are of a dog, and especially even their active submission, the more active they're going to be, all right? The less they're going to be flopping over on their back when they're with us and tucking their tail. So the, the more that we are friendly, we get less of the more extreme type of passive submission, which is related to, like I say, I'm saying in general, is related more to them being more intimidated and, and stuff like that. Um, so the more tolerance and friendliness we get, a more active where they want to come to us. They want to come to us. Very important. It's dog trainers. Also important. I did a stream on issues with police dog handlers and stuff like that, right? Where they want to get submission by contests, beating up the dog. All right. That does not necessarily equal. And a lot of these guys are constantly fighting with their dogs and then your dogs fight with them back in the future, right? Where they don't really have a dominant, a dominant submissive relationship in the way that contributes to friendly interaction with each other. All right. So, so this is like, I always like to refer to things that, that was recorded and, and shows a correlation to natural canine, canine behavior. I highlighted here, the more inquisitive and severe the superior is, yeah, the more the inferior tends toward the passive type of, of submission, right? So the more, yeah, the more inquisitive by that, he's meaning like when the 
domineer superior dogs are like on top of them and in them and in their face they're going to be more they're going to be more passive type of type of su sub submission so same thing now also this is important too i like this he talks about this where if the superior is tolerant but fails to display his superiority the inferior may behave obtrusively so obtrusively is like is this is very important this is what sort of what we saw in the video we saw the video with the little lab puppies right with the jack russell terrier and the german shepherd is you can get the other extreme this is an observation where if the superior if we have submissive behavior towards the superior and the superior is very very tolerant you can get something um, where the inferior will act obtrusively. We'll just do a lot of jumping, be all over, and please like me, please like me, give me attention, that sort of stuff. Now, this is objective. He doesn't say anything about that being good or bad or anything. It's a very objective statement. That I And how is this useful to us? Is you will, I've seen misinterpretations where someone has a very submissive dog that's jumping all over the family members, um, extreme greetings, knocking people over, and people are saying, oh, this dog is being dominant by not listening to you or, or something like that. This is dominant behavior, right? Often you can have what looks like a pushy dog, you know, a pushy dog, a bossy dog. You get all these interpretations where often, especially if the body language fits the bill and all the other interaction fits the bill, is sometimes we just have a dog that really, really wants to be your friend, is totally willing to take the submissive role, but if we are tolerant, we don't have a plan, we haven't really taught them to do something else, um, and and we can get what is behavior that is obtrusive to people. They're not necessarily going to like it. So important in interpreting behavior because people misinterpret that all the time. I've seen that a lot, calling dogs like dominant or bossy or things like that, where really a lot of times it's just dogs that truly are their their intentions is they just want to be friendly. They just want to interact. Will you play with me? They're going to get their opportunists, right? If they, are, if they think you are so great or you have something that they want or they want your massages, of course, they're going to beg for it and keep trying, trying for it. So important points here. Great, great work. Great work by by Rudolf Schenkel here. And I like it because it's, it's not very long. It gets to the point. Things are very clear. And you can totally relate this to, to dog training. He says, in case the superior is not tolerant, threatens or even attacks the inferior, the latter tries to escape and defend himself and shows sign of social stress. All right. So that's that's the dog trainer, right? The, the dog is jumping all over them, and they basically do something really harsh to the dog. And they, they're going to throw that relationship backwards. If they want a love and friendly relationship with the dog, if they are do the equivalent of attacking the inferior for just being try for being obtrusive in a friendly way, you can throw them backwards. So this in no way is meant to give instructions to dog trainers, although it really explains what happens, what motivations are in, in their natural state of canines and what types of consequences you get when at least their own species act a certain way. So awesome stuff. Now, um, why this is important? Why is this important? Which is some of this will be review over here for us. Understanding territorial aggression. This work by Shankle helps. You want references to understanding territorial aggression for sure. It is one of the more, definitely one of the more severe types of territorial aggression that you'll deal with. Understanding different severities of dog on dog aggression. So not just territorial aggression, um, aggression even within the home. People get new homes or they 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 I mean they bring a new dog into the home or they have a dog that matures and then they start fighting and they're kind of equal is sometimes when we get and and more questions will be answered as we go into the David Meech Meech studies 
is you can absolutely get winners or losers at that moment without there being really true submission. And it is, I know I've, I've read it in more than one study that submission is definitely a better, it's a, it's a better, it's a better way to, to, to understand the relationship between two dogs, right? You're, you're much more likely to see proper active submissive behavior than dominant behavior and displays within stable groups, right? The submissive behavior is very, very important that you understand it. Um, understanding proper, underst yeah, understanding submission and proper relationship, all right? So you do not get submission and desire to interact simply by being tougher than the other dog. So I said in the, in the police dog lecture, the, where they're just throwing the dogs on the floor, kicking them and stuff like that, that is not how you get submission. Arguably, you know, they may, some form of the word dominance, if it causes them to control something, to, uh, to, to control something, to control the ball they're trying to get from the dog, right? They may technically have control over a limited resource, but you're not going to get submission that way necessarily. You know, you'll get retreat. You can get uh, another dog given up on the fight, but it does not automatically mean submission by right? just getting the physical contests with dogs. There's so much more to it that we're... That we have yet to learn. Just because a dog acts submissive to another does not mean it will be tolerated. Again, we're getting dogs together. Just because you have this dog that is so friendly and submissive, don't expect you're just going to adopt any dog and bring it into a house or a client's going to be able to take any dog and bring it to the house. It's, submission is not enough to predict the behavior of another canine towards it. And obtrusive behavior is not necessarily dominant behavior all right so that dog that's lifting up his paw and he he wants your attention and wants you to pet him and the one that's that's jumping up on you and won't stop and you're telling him no and you're putting him down he keeps coming up that is not necessarily dominant behavior it's not dominant behavior it could be obtrusive behavior but it's not dominant behavior so let me check out, that's what I got for you for this one. Let me check quick, see if I really messed something up here and I have a big question. Um, let me see. You guys have all kinds of stuff. Art saying, yeah, you guys always have good chitter chatter over here. So easy to teach an alternative behavior to a submissive dog who jumps on you. Or others for attention instead of needing the dog, etc. Agree. Agree. Dave Coppinger has a book on feral dogs. I haven't read it, but knowing who Coppinger was, it's probably good. Yes. He always has good stuff. He definitely has good stuff. Um, yeah, you guys are you got yeah, good stuff. You guys have good stuff posted in here. All right. All right. I'm gonna end this stream. For today, I'll be back on I'll be back on Wednesday. Any questions about this? I'll post I'll I'll answer them in the in the live in the live Q and A. I'll stay on a bit too in the in the chat in case there's anything else. All right, everyone, enjoy your weekend, and I'll be back soon.